When I was in my early teens, I stayed up all night writing a screenplay. When you're trying to get the words on paper and you're three thoughts ahead of yourself and it's a race to get it all down before it goes back to wherever that stuff originally comes from, it was called inspiration. It was as close to the feeling of flying as I have ever had. And when I was alone, I would just draw pictures and I would write little stories and I would make up little characters. And you know, what I was doing was I was exploring a, a world that maybe perhaps I could fit into. People all coming together under one roof to see one story told to them and they don't know each other. They're perfect strangers to one another and they probably don't even agree with each other, but somehow they get into a kind of communal agreement about the story that's being told to them and they all walk out feeling the same way. If it's if it works, if it's successful, is don't worry so much about technique and don't worry so much about where to put the camera or how to light. Worry about one thing or think about one thing. Preoccupy yourself with how do you tell a story that's really interesting that you can get somebody not to walk out of the room right in the, in the middle of your second act of your telling the story. If I had to single out one area to which I have an utter devotion, it would be with my preoccupation with the idea and the fight to still believe in the idea when so many others around you just don't get it and the challenge of staying interested in one single idea for sometimes years and the struggle not to contaminate that idea after months and years of obsessing over it. So I, I didn't really prepare anything um, at home the night before, so let me just talk a little bit about, about something I said, you know, when a journalist asked me years ago a question I really couldn't answer. Uh, you know, they said, what do you, what do you do? Why do you do this? And, and I, I don't know where it came from, but I sort of turned to the journalist in a flip, flip kind of way. I, I said, I dream for a living. And, and, and the, it, it, years later, I realized, well, that's exactly what I, I do. I dream for a living. This is what I've done all my life. This is what I wanted to do with my life. Well, I hope I've been doing that all my career. I hope I've been telling stories my whole career that has, you know, brought people together of, 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 of different ideologies, but people all coming together under one roof to see one story told to them. And they don't know each other. They're perfect strangers to one another. And they probably don't even agree with each other, but somehow they get into a kind of communal agreement about the story that's being told to them. And they all walk out feeling the same way. If, it's, if it works, if it's successful, they all walk out feeling the same way. So I think film and the arts are a great unifier. And, and, and I think I've been doing that my, my, I think my whole career. And the only, only piece of advice, I don't have, don't have a lot of time, but the only piece of advice I love to give is don't worry so much about technique and don't worry so much about where to put the camera or how to light. Worry about one thing or think about one thing. Preoccupy yourself with how do you tell a story that's really interesting that you can get somebody not to walk out of the room right in the, in the middle of your second act of your telling the story. How do you just tell a story that, they, that, that people lean into what you're saying and they don't lean back, they don't like start looking around the room. Find a way first a, a compelling way to express your art through your storytelling. Mm -hmm. Once you've got that, there's a lot of people in this world that will go get around you and, and show you the ropes. But learning how to be a storyteller is the most important advice I can give you. Well, what you choose to do next is what we call in the movies, the character defining moment. Now, these are moments that you're very familiar with, like in the last Star Wars, The First Force Awakens, when Rey realizes the Force is with her or Indiana Jones choosing Mission Over Fear by jumping into a pile of snakes. Now, in a two-hour movie, you get a handful of character-defining moments, but in real life, you face them every day. Life is one strong, long string of character-defining moments. And I was lucky that at 18, I knew what I exactly wanted to do, but I didn't know who I was. I, how, how could I and how could any of us? Because for the first 25 years of our lives, we are trained to listen to voices that are not our own. Parents and professors fill our heads with wisdom and information, and then employers and mentors 
take their place and explain how this world really works. And usually these voices of authority make sense, but sometimes doubt starts to creep into our heads and into our hearts. And even when we think that's not quite how I see the world, it's kind of easier just to nod in agreement and go along. And for a while, I let that going along define my character because I was repressing my own point of view because like in that Nielsen song, everybody was talking at me so I couldn't hear the echoes of my mind. And at first, the internal voice I needed to listen to was hardly audible and it was hardly noticeable, kind of like me in high school. But then I started paying more attention and my intuition kicked in. And I want to be clear that your intuition is different from your conscience. They work in tandem, but here's the distinction. Your conscience shouts, here's what you should do, while your intuition whispers, here's what you could do. Listen to that voice that tells you what you could do. Nothing will define your character more than that. I've got to ask you, for anyone watching at home who's you know, a young filmmaker or director or wants right. to write or create films, mm -hmm. what would be your top tips? Well, I, I can only give advice based on my own life and what I've experienced myself. I spent a lot of time alone as a kid. I was a loner. <laughs> and I spent a lot of time kind of in my room and uh, because I just, just felt comfortable that way. And when I was alone, I would just draw pictures and I would write little stories and I would make up little characters. And you know, what I was doing was I was exploring a little bit like your cafe. I was exploring a, wor a world that maybe perhaps I could fit into because I wasn't fitting in very well to the world that I was, you know, that I was living in at, at the time. I couldn't imagine, based on the story that we told, that an audience would tolerate the, just, just the amount of, 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 of violence, you know, human against human, or, or inhuman against human. And, and I, I just couldn't imagine that audiences would allow themselves to go through a motion picture recreation of Os the Oscar Schindler story. I was very surprised. But as you're telling the story, you can't pull your punches because history is history. History is history, and, and if you're making, you know, I, I felt that if I'm going to make, you know, a, a story that represents the survivors and represents the six million that, you know, who were murdered, I have to be as close to the reality of the people that we had interviewed that told us what it was like for them. A.T. was a gift that came from the heavens for me. I was in Tunisia making Raiders of the Lost Ark, and we were setting up a, a shot, and I was picking up fo fossils in the desert, which used to be the bottom of the ocean millions of years ago. We were out there in the Nefta Desert. I was picking up, uh, and I was remembering the end of Close Encounters, when Richard Dreyfuss goes up into the mothership, and just before that, the little alien comes down and does the hand signs to Francois Truffaut. And it just hit me out of the sky. I thought, what if that alien had stayed behind on Earth? What if he didn't? What if it was a kind of foreign exchange? Dreyfus goes away and the alien stays. And it suddenly this whole story hit me like a ton of bricks. And, which was really a story about my mom and dad when they got divorced and how I felt as a kid wanting a, a friend like that to fill the void in my life. And, and, and all these things came pouring in and I actually put the story together in a couple of I think a couple of days. As this is obviously based on a, on a on on the great Broadway musical, but it will be liberally compared to the 1961 film. Uh, both the 61 film and the Broadway musical both owe a huge debt of gratitude to William Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet. So yeah. I didn't feel like I was violating anything because I don't really necessarily love remakes, but I didn't consider this a remake. I, I considered this a, a, a reimagined. Uh, auth more authentic and more contemporary version of the original musical. Um, but I think this musical has been performed thousands of times in community theater, in high schools, in colleges, uh, 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 in revivals all over the world, in New York, Los Angeles, in, in Tokyo, as recently as a year, year and a half ago. And I felt that because it is so liberally reproduced again and again, Every new cast brings a different interpretation. They may say the same lines because they're, by contract, forced to say the same lines that was originally written in the 1950s, but they're able to interpret those lines in a new modern way. 
If I had to single out one area to which I have an utter devotion, it would be with my preoccupation with the idea and the fight to still believe in the idea when so many others around you just don't get it and the challenge of staying interested in one single idea for sometimes years and the struggle not to contaminate that idea after months and years of obsessing over it. When I was in my early teens, I stayed up all night writing a screenplay and felt something to this day I swear I cannot get enough of. It was as close to the feeling of flying as I have ever had. You know what I mean when, when you're trying to get the words on paper and you're three thoughts ahead of yourself and it's a race to get it all down before it goes back to wherever that stuff originally comes from? And it was called Inspiration. And I actually made a movie from that script I wrote all night, and it was called Firelight. And it was truly an awful movie. <laughs> but the process was what it was all about. The experience of that obsessive focus of having an idea and actually being able to photograph it. That's been the magic potion for me ever since. You seem to get very strong performances and naturalistic performances from your actors. What's your technique? I don't know if it's so much of a technique. I asked, I asked the actor to, <clears throat> for the most part, to, to give me too much so I can then take it down to a level that I, that I feel is believable. I don't like casting actors who are low-key people. I like people with energy. So in, in the initial casting, I think that half of what a director does is cast his picture well. And, and, and the other half is, uh, is you know, the, the, the control of the people within that. But I think half of the secret, when you do see a good picture and you like the people, it's in the casting. Uh, I, I like people who are outspoken and who are very large so I can bring them down to life level. I've yeah. always said that this is, Universal's been my ancestral home <laughs> all these years. Are the stories true that you used to sneak onto the lot here when you were a young guy? Yeah. How old? Probably about 16. So you couldn't be tried as an adult at that point? No, I would have definitely been taken to juvenile court and gotten a suspended sentence for giving it a good try. But I wasn't caught, thank goodness. I had a pass for three days, and I just took a chance. The guard would remember I had been, I had been here on three consecutive so you're days. you regular. I walked in with no pass the fourth day, and he waved me through, and it was that way for the next three months of my summer vacation. Really? That's how I spent my summer vacation. Just coming in, and what would you do? I would just in. watch television shows being shot. I would go all around the lot. Watching the kind of coordination on a set, just watching, everybody knew what they needed to do, and they did their jobs, and it was very much like uh, a kind of uh, team sport. Did you see any filmmakers that you admired? Hitchcock, but I got thrown off that set very no. quickly. I was on the torn curtain set for about 10 minutes before someone came and told me to leave. Did you, you know, get to see him? I in, got like... to see Hitchcock and Julie Andrews. Got kicked off by a third AD. What, uh, so show me your papers? Or, uh... said, why are you here? And I said, I'm just here to watch. And they said, well, no, this is a closed set. And that was the end of it. Youth can really bring change. And this film, I felt very strongly, it addresses the youth. It's, it's a conversation of Mr. Spielberg with the youth straight, direct. It is. It's a direct a conversation and dialogue with the, this, the, the young people all over the world today. And we all we intended that to be a conversation with them. I also feel that it's this generation that's going to determine the fate of all of us. And it's, it's how they're influenced and what influences them. And if they can start a conversation with people who are different than they are, if xenophobia someday can be in our rearview mirror and not in, in our present day vernacular, if there, and I think all of that is gonna be accomplished by several new generations of young people who really care about each other. And, and you know, and I, I really feel that the secret ingredient in all of this is trying to find or rediscover empathy. So I have always felt that an incredible dance number in a musical is just as impressive and likely just as difficult to pull off as a big screen action sequence. I feel like you've now proven that you're the master at both. So I'm curious, what is the through line? What is the constant for both? A skill you used, a muscle you flexed on action sequences in Jaws or Raiders or Jurassic Park that you also found yourself using in the big dance numbers of West Side Story. Uh, I wish there was some similarity between like the storming of the beaches 
on Saving Private Ryan, Omaha Beach, and like the, for instance, the dance in the gym. But there is a, there is a remarkable distinction between the two. Uh, I'm not constrained in an action sequence by, by time, by tempi, by, 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 by the mathematics of music. Um, um, on a musical sequence, we are all locked in uh, to the measure, to the beat, to the tempi. Uh, what, is it 2-4 time? Is it 4-4 four, four time? It's got to end exactly where it ends. It's got to begin only where it can begin. So in a way, scientifically, I'm, instead of having this much latitude, I've got about this much latitude to get everything I want to get in such a small amount of time, because then the music changes, compelling me to change the angle. So it is... And I was never good at math. I can't believe I could actually do a musical, because my father kept saying to me, Steve, how can how can we get getting you keep getting C's and D's in algebra, and I said that I don't have your genius mathematical mind, and uh, and then I wind up doing a musical which is all about math. But I had a lot of people to help me. I had a great choreographer Justin Peck, tremendous cinematographer Janusz Kaminski, a great art director, production designer um, in in Adam Stockhausen, and a great company of actors and singers and and dancers and Justin. And so we really worked as a team. This was a this was a monumental collaboration to pull this off. I think the beginning of my career, I had this wonderful experience, and and the thing I really want to emphasize is, I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice. When you have a dream, and the dream isn't something you dream and then it happens, the dream is something you never knew was going to come into your life. Dreams always come from behind you, not not right between your eyes. It sneaks up on you. But when you have a dream, it doesn't often come at you screaming in your face, this is who you are, this is what you must be for the rest of your life. Sometimes a dream almost whispers. And I've always said to my kids, the hardest thing to listen to, your instincts, your human personal intuition, always whispers, it never shouts. Very hard to hear. So you have to, every day of your lives, be ready to hear what whispers in your ear it very rarely shouts. And if you can listen to the whisper, and if it's, it tickles your heart, and it's something you think you want to do for the rest of your life, then that is going to be what you do for the rest of your life, and we will benefit. It's always been a, uh, an emotional quotient in, in every film of yours. And is emotion close to you? And what is the deciding factor? Uh, is business more important for you, or the emotional factor in a story? No, the emotional factor in the story always trumps Because business. you have been breaking the business barriers very often. But, but what, 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 what calls to me is not whether a film is going to make a gazillion dollars. Mm -hmm. What calls to me is, is there an, a, a, a deep urge in the center of myself that only that film will release and, and, then, ex and, and then exorcise. And, and that's the only condition I'll direct a movie. Uh, if I'm doing a sequel, of course. If I'm doing The Lost World, The Secret of Jurassic Park, of course, I know that the bar has been raised because if it doesn't make this X amount of money, everybody thinks it's a failure. And there's that added pressure of great expectation. The Indiana Jones uh, series, they're not sequels, but on all the other three Indiana Jones films that I've directed, there's a tremendous level of expectation. And that's nerve wracking. Yeah. But, but the fact that those movies are successful and make a lot of money isn't why I decided to direct sequels to the Indiana Jones series. What advice would you give to kids who want to make movies? Oh, it's, it's, it's a good question because I would, I would tell kids who want to make movies to make movies. <laughs> when I was a kid, the only way I could make movies was borrow money from my father and borrow his 8mm movie camera and borrow the money because film was expensive. The film and the developing of the film was expensive then. Today, you can take your telephone, your, your, your cell phone, and you can make a movie on that. And if it's a really cool movie and it's funny and it's dramatic or whatever, you can post it on YouTube. So it's a lot easier for kids today to get started and follow their passion and pursue their hearts, you know, desire to be a filmmaker because the tools that were less available to my generation growing up are completely available to yours. So there's no reason why you can't express who you are through video. Spielberg spent $30 million making 1941, an over-budget, sophomoric attempt at comedy. The film was considered an artistic and financial flop by both critics and moviegoers, 
and marked his first, and so far only, crashing failure. Well, I was low. I was depressed. I was not feeling good. What got you out of it? Uh, starting just throwing myself back into my work again and starting to uh, work on Raiders. Action! Burned by the disaster of 1941, Spielberg redeemed himself in the eyes of the movie industry with the success of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Indiana Jones was the hero of Raiders. He, could, he, he won the lady and got the treasure, and I wanted to be the behind-the-scenes hero who brought the film in for under schedule and under budget. What I find with you is that it's truly what interests you, what it is you want to know at that point, what it is you want to see. And I think it's okay that, that a first-time filmmaker... Uh, being so inspired by movies and music videos and any kind of music or media um, um, can make a derivative film. It's okay that your first videos and your first attempts at telling a story are derivative, are obviously influenced by something that you Inspired know, them. that you saw last week and you want to kind of do a version. There's nothing wrong with learning the ABCs, yeah. learning your craft by being derivative, but at some point you're going to need to find your natural voice yeah. and find a way to give voice to who you are. And who you are, by the way, who you are is original. It just is, because you're not Tom, you're not me, and you're, you're not your best friend, and you're not your teacher, you're not your parents. You are you. And because of that, you do have every bone in your body is an original bone. Um, it's sometimes trying to figure out how to express your own original analogy, and that sometimes takes a number of years to figure yourself out. People say, you know, gee, the movie's really scary because my imagination saw more of the shark than you actually showed me. Well, part of that was, was intentional because I wanted, I thought I could scare people with just the ocean line and, and just the mystery of what's under the murky water, but also the darn shark wouldn't come out of his dressing room for months. I mean, the thing never worked. The shark on Jaws works much better on the Universal Tour than it ever worked on Martha's Vineyard when I made Jaws.